Well, it's good to be here. Praise God for unity that we've had in the church all these last years. Just knowing about other problems going on elsewhere, it makes me so thankful. I think it's been maybe three years now, or two and a half, since we've had really any big issues in church as far as disunity. And that's really encouraging. It's something to keep seeking to defer to one another, that we ourselves not become a reason for disunity. And yet at the same time, not ever to compromise. And if there's a reason for disunity, like Paul said, there must be divisions in the church to prove who's true and who's false. So may the Lord keep helping us there. Well, as I prayed about what to preach, we're going to land in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I love the Apostle Paul. If you're not a Christian or you're a new Christian, you may not know Paul used to go by the name Saul. He was what you could call a terrorist. He was involved in persecuting Christians. Yet he was a religious man. Kind of like modern, modern day Muslims. They're religious, yet they're involved in violence against Christians. That's what Paul was before the Lord saved him. He was a self-righteous Pharisee. And it's amazing as you read the New Testament and you see this man who's involved in murder and you see some of the statements he made. It is One, it's such a testament to the power of the new birth. You see, this man really is saved from the penalty and the power of his sins. The power of his sins through the new birth. The penalty through justification. And Paul says things like Acts 24.16. He says, I always take pains to have a clear conscience both before God and before man. I mean, think of that. Paul living to always have a clear conscience. How did that happen? How did a man like Saul of Tarsus become a man who always takes pains to have a clear conscience? A man who says things in Acts 20.24 that he doesn't even account his own life as of any value, if only one thing, that he can minister to the Gospel of the grace of God. That's Paul the Apostle. I love his attitude. I love his heart. And that's why I want to go to 2 Corinthians 6.3 today. Because as we look at Paul, remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11? He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And as we look at Paul, he's calling every Christian here today to imitate him. Is he a minister of the Gospel? Yes, but whether you're in the ministry or not, you're called to imitate Jesus Christ. And Paul is a great mentor for all of us even though he's dead. So, 2 Corinthians 6. We can start in verse... Well, let's start in verse 1. Working together with Him, referring to God who's made Him an ambassador, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For He says, in a favorable time I listened to you, in a day of salvation I've helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now let's look at verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Pause there. We're going to look at that list. But verse 3, that's what I want to go after today. What makes Paul say, I don't want to put any obstacle for anyone lest fault be found with my ministry. That's an amazing statement. Let's pray. Lord, thank You. Again, we just thank You that You've given us Your Word. Lord, we know how big of a mess it would be here if we didn't have Your Word. If we just had our own convictions. But Lord, You've given us a standard. You've given us Your Word. It's truth. It sanctifies us. It's light. 
in our minds. It's light to give us direction where to go, how to walk as Christians. And Lord, that's what we want. I pray, Lord, You would make all of us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And in a lesser way, make us more like the Apostle Paul. Please, Lord, would You do that very thing in all of our lives? Why? For Your glory. Lord, it's not about us. Lord, we want You to be honored. We want You to be glorified. Quicken up the sanctification, Lord. Make us like You. Make this church like You. Lord, help us. Just pray You'd be with us today during this message. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. All right. First context. Why, what's going on, Paul? Look at 5.12. Just right above, he says we're not commending ourselves to you again. Why is he writing then? But we're giving you, those at Corinth, cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. In short, Paul's saying, I'm writing this to you ultimately not to commend myself to you. I've already done that in some measure, but I want you to take these things to those who are our enemies and I want you to explain to them, look, this is Paul's ministry. So that's what's making Paul go in this direction right here. He wants them to be able to give an answer. So he's not, he's not going to commend himself in some proud way. Paul's doing it out of love for the truth, out of love for the church. Now let's read verse 3 again. So in the context of that, look at this statement Paul makes. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. Years ago, I read that and instantly I wrote in my Bible next to it, I said, is this so of my ministry? I just read that and I thought, is that so of me? Whatever ministry, whatever that word means, which we'll look at, is that so of me? Can I say what Paul just said? Can I say that I don't put obstacles in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with my ministry. So I wrote that years ago. And you know what happened? I remember reading through Corinthians again, and I read that little footnote that I had added for myself, and things came to my conscience. And I realized there is fault with ministry that I'm involved in. And God brought things to my mind. And I was able to deal with them. And so that's one thing, again, as we go through this, ask yourself that, that question. Now, what is the ministry here? Yes, I think it is specifically referring more so to ministers, but look at 2 Corinthians 5, 18. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 20, he says we're ambassadors of Christ. So in a way, all of us, are ministers of reconciliation. Every one of us is out there as a Christian and we want to see people who are not reconciled to God reconciled to God. Reconciliation, a bringing in to a right relationship. Just like I preached on a month ago, Romans 5.10, about He reconciles His enemies through the death of His Son. And we talked about that Satanist who had been converted after 30 plus years. That man was reconciled. He wasn't in a right relationship with God. He was an enemy. And then he was brought in through the death of his, the Son. And so when you think about fault with my ministry, for you here today, think specifically my ministry of trying to reconcile sinners to God. Is there any fault that could be found with that? The reason that matters as we go through this is think about how big of a deal that is. What's more important than bringing souls to Christ. What's more of an important ministry than that? Yeah, and it's for the glory of God. It's all involved with God being glorified. Saving a peculiar people for His own possession. But think of that. This is huge. You, know, you think about the president 
The president, he doesn't want to put any obstacles. Well, that may not be true. But if we had a Christian president, he wouldn't want to put obstacles before the country. He wouldn't want fault to be found with his presidency. Paul's saying here, here I am a minister, seeking to have men reconciled to God, and I don't want there to be fault with my ministry. My point is there's nothing bigger than that. There's nothing more important than that, than this ministry we've been given. Second question before we dive into this. What attitude, what gives a man this attitude? What do you think gives Paul this attitude? We see it. 2 Corinthians 5.14 Paul says here what his controlling, constraining factor is. What does it say in 5.14? Yeah, the love of Christ constrains us compels us. It controls us. Because I've made a conclusion. I believe that one has died for all. Therefore, I've died. I die daily. I pick up my cross. I follow Him. I don't live for myself anymore. But I live for Him. That's what gives a man this attitude. The Christian who has seen Christ died for me and the love of Christ is controlling his life. That's the motive. The only way you will be able to imitate Paul in 2 Corinthians 6.3 is if you're compelled by love for Jesus Christ. Not a love for people. Not a love for popularity. But a love for the Lord. A love for His glory. That's got to be the motivating factor. So that's the attitude. Now where are we going? There's three things I want to knock down in this passage. I want us all to imitate Paul's attitude of keeping integrity, of having no fault, of not being discredited in his ministry. Two, I want us all to realize the seriousness of putting obstacles out. It's not a minor thing as we'll look at to put an obstacle out. I mean, you think about it. If I put something there to trip people coming in the door, I put an obstacle, they trip, they fall on the ground. You put an obstacle before someone's soul, they trip, they can fall into hell. It can be an occasion of leading them to hell. And Jesus says this is a serious saying. If you sin against one of His little ones, you sin against Christ. It's not ultimately you sin against them, you sin against Christ. So this is serious. Thirdly, I want you to see the things Paul commends that we may strive for the same. We're going to look at that list of commendations. And you've got to ask yourself, can I commend these in my life? In my ministry? If I can't, why not? What am I doing to strive for that? So, think of, you can think of today some as an inspection. You know, we've got a building inspector coming here this week to inspect our building. Are they going to find fault with it? They, they might. <laughs> we'll see. Paul says, I don't want fault to be found with my ministry. I don't want it. All right, well, let's look at the text, verse 3. Put no obstacles. I really want to define that. We can read this, and you read, we put no obstacle. What is he talking about? The word in its original, it means to do something which causes others to stumble, which leads them into error and into sin. You hear that? It, it's it putting an occasion for stumbling. So you could reread the verse. We put no error doctrinally, we put no sin practically in our life in anyone's way. We put no stumbling block. Why? That no fault may be found with our ministry. Now, we're going to look at more examples, but I wanted to give a couple going into this just to think about examples. Um, You think about Peter in Galatians. He put a stumbling block. He was eating right there Jew, Gentile, together, no big deal. 
What happens? Paul comes in. He gets away. He's not commending himself by boldness. He's having the fear of man. And the fear of man led to hypocritical stuff happening. It says right there in Galatians 2, For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. So that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I, Paul, saw that their conduct was not in step with the true Gospel, he publicly rebuked him. Example. Stumbling block. Put in. How? Fear. As we look at this list of commendations, Paul commends suffering, different things, his speech. And realize this, the opposite of commending boldness, if you don't have boldness, you may have fear. And that fear led Peter to compromise. It led to hypocrisy. It led for him to have fault to be found with his ministry. So that's, that's one thing as we go into this to think about. Another, 1 Corinthians 9.12. Paul says, if others share this rightful claim on you of making a living on the Gospel, do not we even more? Now listen to Paul. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the Gospel of Christ. You hear that? Same word. Obstacle in the way of the Gospel of Christ. What was the obstacle there? What was it? Was it sin? Was it lust? Impatience? Anger? Nope. He had a liberty. He had a right. If Paul would have selfishly used his right, used his liberty, he would have been putting a stumbling block before them. So when you think about I'm not going to put any obstacle before someone. One way you can put an obstacle before someone is through your liberties. Not dying to your liberties. And when I say liberties, what you eat, what days you observe. It's these non-essential areas. You esteem Christmas. Others don't even do anything about it. You have the liberty to do that. And you can have that liberty and exercise it. But what's the opposite? You take this thing that you and your conscience are convinced you can do, you make a to-do list and a law out of it, and you stuff it on someone else. That also is putting an occasion for stumbling. So when Paul says we didn't put obstacles in anyone's way, one thing from 1 Corinthians 9-12 beforehand that I think he's thinking about is in genuine love, I will not selfishly use my liberty in any way if it's going to cause fault to be found with my ministry. I mean, that really means what it means. Everything in my life, how I speak, how I dress, everything, is anything I'm doing going to put an occasion for stumbling for someone? I don't want that to happen. Because I could put an obstacle. So we have rights. So liberties and rights used selfishly put out an obstacle. Drink, food, etc. These are non-essential convictions. And the opposite is you can make a to-do list out of it. You know, there's a sister in Romania who's a translator. And she's labored with, I'll be honest, and translated for five years. And she had a group, very like-minded Christians. It seemed for a season. But these Christians had a rule. They had some standard. Not backed up in here. Dealing with how to dress. And they pushed that on her. They had the to-do list. What did they just do? They disobeyed 2 Corinthians 6 3. They put an obstacle in anyone's way. What you want, what I want, I want the middle ground. I don't want to be putting any of my to do list on any of you 
And I don't want to be taken advantage of any of my liberties in any way whatsoever if it causes any type of stumbling for anyone at all. Paul was instantly willing to die to his rights. If meat causes problems, I'm not going to eat it again. If this causes problems, I'm not going to do it again. You can make a list out of it, whatever it is. Ask yourself. I had to ask myself that. Am I putting an obstacle in anyone's way through my liberties, through my convictions of my conscience that are not on essentials? And just to clarify, obviously, we better not waver on our convictions on the Gospel, on essentials. We better not. If we waver in that, we're in trouble. Okay, so that's kind of an idea of obstacles when you think about it. Now look at the next word. Put no obstacles in whose way? Anyone's way. Jew. Gentile. Paul, what are you trying to tell me? He's trying to tell us, be hypersensitive to every single group. As you seek to use liberties to reach one group, make sure in doing that, you're now not able to reach another group. And people say, what, you expect me to seek to please everyone? Huh, what did Paul say? 1 Corinthians 10.33, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do. Try? Are we gonna? No. We're gonna fail. But don't use that thing, well, I'm gonna fail. No, try. Paul said, I'm gonna try. I'm, I'm trying in my own life to not put an obstacle in anyone's way. And I know my pitfall is not my liberties. My pitfall is my own to-do list of convictions. And so I'm hypersensitive to make sure I don't do that. That I don't push it on someone else's conscience. Because then I can't say I've put no obstacle in anyone's way. And Paul said, I do it all for the sake of the Gospel. Remember, that's the motive. The love of Christ is controlling this man and it's got to control us. Okay. Look at the text. We put no obstacle in anyone's way. We put no occasion for stumbling. No stumbling block in a Jew or a Gentile or anyone's way. doesn't matter what culture they're from. We're seeking to do what we can to please all men, that we can get the Gospel to them. We're laying aside our own rights. Why? So that no fault may be found with our ministry. No fault. So what's the first obvious thing again that he's saying? If you put an obstacle, guess what it leads to? Fault being found with your ministry. Being discredited. You know what it means to be discredited? You lose credibility. They look at you, there's no credibility. That occasion for stumbling, that obstacle, you now try to take them the Gospel, but because of it, you don't have credibility with them. And Paul is saying, this Gospel, it's so important. I want it to get to people that the last thing on my mind is my rights, my convictions, I'm putting them over there that I can reach this person over there. He doesn't want to be disproved. He doesn't want to be unreliable. Will people make it an excuse to reject the Gospel because of your conduct at times? Yeah, they'll do that. But we can't live on that. Well, they rejected it and it's, it's all their fault. Paul says here, you can have fault with your ministry of bringing a soul to Christ. You can put an obstacle before Him. So we need to be willing to examine ourselves there. To be at fault, it's to be blamed. You know what it means to be blamed for something? Your fault. Have you ever gotten a car wreck and you get blamed for the wreck? Whether it's valid or not, you get blamed for the wreck. Let me ask you this. A car wreck is very minor compared to what? Wrecking someone's soul. Putting an occasion of stumbling through forcing convictions on someone that are not dogmatic in the Scriptures by exercising your liberty selfishly and being unwilling to die to them. 
Now, I've mentioned 1 Corinthians 9.12 about obstacles. Think of this. If your liberties and convictions can be an obstacle, how much more sin, right? If things that are not even at the core sin, your conviction is not sin. It's sin when without being in genuine love, you force it on someone. Your liberty is not sin, but it's sin when you selfishly use your right and you put a stumbling block before someone you're trying to reach. If that's wrong, then think how much more will sin in your life discredit your ministry. And that's what we're really going to look at in all these commendations in a minute. Look at 6 verse 1. Who are we working together with? The Him there is God. With the Lord. We're co-workers of God. It's one thing at your job to cause a stumbling that makes it look bad on your coworker. Say you and your coworker are on the same shift and you do something, you sin, and then it looks bad on you and your coworker. That's one thing. It's another for us, co-workers of God, to do something and it looks bad to the world on the Lord. I don't want that to happen in my life. A hypocritical messenger can so easily taint the message. All right, so let's look at, at the end of this verse. No fault may be found with our ministry. And then look what Paul goes on to do. But as servants of God, we approve, we commend, or we prove ourselves in every way. Before we look at the list, look at that last word. How many ways are you to approve yourself? How many ways are you to commend yourself? How many ways and how many areas am I to seek to prove myself? In every way. To what people? To anyone. To any person, in every way, I'm seeking to commend myself to you. I just mentioned that word, every way. That's pretty exclusive. That's challenging to me. Because you can't just say, well, that one area, now put that to the side. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You seek in that area to commend yourself. Seek to do that. Here, question is, is this your attitude? Is this your attitude as a Christian? It was the attitude of Paul. It was the attitude of Christ. And you and I are commanded to imitate them. Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 4.4, I don't know of anything against myself. I don't know of anything against myself. That's amazing. That doesn't mean I'm acquitted. The Lord's going to judge me. But as far as my conscience is, Paul's saying it's clear. Okay. 2 Peter 2.2, it says, And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. I just read that verse because may that never be said of us. May the truth never be blasphemed because of this church or your own personal ministry of being an ambassador of Christ and reconciling men to God. Through sensuality, through sin, these men blaspheme the Lord. Blaspheme the truth. The way of the truth is blasphemed. And so Paul comes in here defending his ministry into verse 4, and he says, I commend myself in every way. I'm going to prove myself to you that I'm sincere, that my ministry is accredited ministry. You know, he's pulling out all the college degrees to prove I've got the credit. Look at that. I'm in the class. I'm not putting fault before someone. I'm doing what I said in Acts 24, taking pains to have a clear conscience before God and man. Now in verses 4 through 10, we're going to divide it up into three things. First, 
We're going to look at the trials under which he maintained his ministry without fault. Second, we'll look at the graces and gifts by which he demonstrated his ministry without fault. And thirdly, we'll look at various circumstances under which he maintained his ministry without fault. I'm grouping it like that. That's how Paul grouped it together. So, let's start here. Let's look at, let's look at the beginning. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. By great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. What did we just read? A lot of trials that this man went through. And we could spend an hour just looking at the trials the Apostle Paul endured. It's incredible. Shipwrecked, flogged, the list goes on. It gives us no right to complain about what physical suffering we've had. I I was just reading about one brother that we know of. He was in prison for 15 years. That's a long time. But much more to get beaten and then stuck in prison. Much more to be tortured during that time. And yet here Paul, he commends his ministry. Now remember, if he doesn't have these commendations, if he can't go in here and say, I have great endurance, if you have no endurance, what does that do to your ministry? It discredits your ministry. If you look at a church and the ministry is not enduring, And it's just this momentary thing. They get a little zeal. And then they don't endure at all. Tons of people fall away. They get a little puff of smoke. They go back down. The world doesn't look at that ministry. They don't look at that church. And they don't say, that's a credible church. But rather, it discredits. And Paul's saying, by my great endurance, have I not given credibility that this Gospel's real? Because remember, he, his motive here is, I don't want anyone in this day of salvation, which is today, to look at me and say, you're the reason that the Gospel doesn't have credibility because you put this stumbling block here, here, and here, Paul. Paul's saying, I don't want that. No. I've commended myself. Many are falling away, yet I've endured. I'm that blessed man who remains steadfast when under trial, who will receive the crown of life. Paul says, I'm commending myself in afflictions and sufferings. This isn't some prosperity gospel. I'm commending myself to you as being genuine because I have suffered. Because he said in Philippians 1.29, it's been granted to you, Christian, to believe and also to suffer for His sake. And Paul's commending. I've suffered. If a a church doesn't commend men who suffer, like the prosperity Gospel does, that makes their ministry not credible. You see, to not have that which the Bible guarantees you will enter the kingdom through many tribulations is to not have a credible ministry. He goes on. He says, I've commended myself in hardships. Hardships. You know, you think about one man who commended himself in hardships and it was the man named Job. Imagine having your own wife look at you and say, curse God and die. And yet Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gave and the Lord took away. Blessed be His name. That gave Job a credible ministry. If you were back then and you see this man who's blameless and then all that misery happens and he just lashes out in fits of anger, You wouldn't look at Job and say that man's a credible man. You wouldn't look at him and say there's no fault that can be found in his ministry. You see what we're looking at here is sin in your life will discredit your ministry. And not having things the Bible guarantees can lose credibility. That doesn't mean I go seek to suffer that I can commend it. Don't go do that. Calamities. You think about the man who wrote it as well with my soul. The ship sinks, his five daughters drown. Was it a struggle? Was there a war there? I'm sure. But when he sailed back over that ocean where his five daughters had died and were under that sea somewhere, he wrote that song. It is well with my soul. Whatever my lot, the Lord has taught me it is well. 
Do you know what he just did by responding like that? He commended his ministry. He showed my ministry is not, is not with fault here. And then I think later on, he had two more children and they died. I mean, how many kids are you going to have die? And yet you can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. No fault to be found with his ministry in that trial. The same was of Paul. You think about beatings. Who gave us the perfect example of how to respond in beatings? The Lord Jesus Christ. As a lamb was led to the slaughter, before His shearers He was silent. He opened not His mouth. If anyone you would say had a right to open His mouth, it would have been Him. And He didn't do it. He responded in beatings in such a way. What a commendable ministry. Men look at that ministry and it gives it credibility. Your response in trials will either discredit or credit you. Not just your ministry, but your profession of faith as a Christian. Do we respond bad at times? Yes. We do sin. We stumble in many ways. But that's not our lifestyle. You can't be a true Christian and continue in sin. If you say you know Him, but you walk in darkness, you're a liar, John says. And the truth isn't in you. So, did Paul discredit and cause fault to be on his ministry in the midst of trials? No, he didn't. And I know I didn't have a lot of specifics of Paul. But you can just read through. Go read through Acts in the second half. If you want to see Paul in his endurance, his faith even on a ship is just going to sink. And how he's even taken advantage of that as a Gospel situation. Paul wasn't there having an anxiety attack. He wasn't there panicking under the pressure. He was committing himself to God. He was glorifying the Lord. So he goes on to another clump. Verse 6, he gives graces and gifts which he demonstrated his ministry to be without fault. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, Genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God. Remember, ask yourself, can I commend myself in these things? Could I, like Paul, write a letter to the church at Grace Community and commend myself in every way to anyone in these things? First thing on the list, purity. Uprightness of life. You want to talk about an easy way to discredit your ministry? Impurity. Impurity. Because of lust, many men discredit their ministry. As Brother David talked about in the Sunday school, Paul said, if you think you stand, you better take heed lest you fall. And David pointed out a lot of men, his friend who lost credibility, it was not in the beginning of the Christian race. It was later on. He slowly started to drift, to neglect different things, to not hold to a good conscience and to faith. And his ship hit a rock, and it appears to have shipwrecked. Why? I've already learned the elementary things. I've already learned the prayer. I don't need to do prayer anymore. I'm self-reliant. That proud attitude leads many to fall. One way I've known many have fallen in the ministry has been through an inappropriate emotional attachment with someone of the opposite gender. They talk too much. Too deep. With someone of the opposite gender, their hearts get fused. Leads to adultery in the heart. Leads to discrediting their ministry once it gets above the surface. Yet Paul, he was pure. He wasn't giving in to sin. A pure motive for what he did. Remember, what controlled Paul? The love of Christ. Not the love of fame. Not the love of popularity. The love of Jesus Christ. He goes on here. He mentions, what does he say next? Purity by knowledge. I've already kind of hit on that. Knowledge. Knowledge. You know 
it's okay for me to eat this certain type of meat. It's fine now to eat it. Even if it was sacrificed to an idol, but then a new convert comes in from that pagan background, and with my knowledge of that, rather than love them and die to my right, I eat in front of them and cause them to stumble. You need to use your knowledge of the truth to love people. And he commends himself in knowledge in the sense that he knows his Bible. He knows the Word. That's, that's very commendable. You know, and what, what Christian doesn't say, I wish I knew my Bible better? You know, you hear that interview of my father-in-law who died years ago. Here he basically memorized the majority of the New Testament, and when he's dying, he keeps saying, I wish I knew my Bible better. But he's wanting to commend himself to the church up there of his knowledge of the Word of God. That he's rightly handling the Word of truth. What's the next thing, Paul? Patience. Patience. You want to talk about another way you can discredit your ministry? It's in patience. It's the opposite of patience. And patience kind of leads to anger. You know, someone called the church phone the other day. And, and I thought about it. Imagine if when they called, I, re, I answered it very impatient. This Grace Community Church, what do you need? I wouldn't have done that, obviously, but the tone, you know, that impatient tone, you know what I would have been doing right there? In that person's mind, through my sin of impatience, I would be laying an obstacle that they could now find fault with my ministry, with the ministry of the church. Why? A little sin. Little impatience. Galatians 5.20 goes on to say those who have fits of anger, they won't even inherit the kingdom. A man with a fit of anger, that's his lifestyle. He's not a true Christian, Paul's saying. How much more should we flee from impatience and pray, God, give me grace to overcome this? You know, there's a well-known man. He had a massive ministry, a missions society, and he reached all over the world. And as I've heard others mention, this man he was known in his life that he had fits of anger all the time. It was well-known. He was always angry. Not just did that man have a discredited ministry, but if you take these warning passages to mean what they mean and not shove them under the table, that man, there's warning if he's even a Christian. Paul says, fits of anger won't inherit. Yeah, the true Christian who struggles with that, that warning puts fear in them. I'm going to obey that stop sign. I'm not going to keep going this way. Lord, give me grace. So here Paul is, he's commending himself in these saints. You know, you even think about in Acts when Paul maybe was a little impatient to the high priest, I believe it was, and he responded quickly. And then they said, do you not know you just reviled God's high priest? What did Paul do? He instantly cleared his conscience. Paul had a shadow with the Savior. He realized, I've sinned. I wasn't supposed to do that to the high priest. And he cleared his conscience. That's right before he went into saying he always took pains to have a clear conscience. So Paul here, he's serious about having purity. Kindness. Can we commend our ministry by kindness? When I read this years ago and I wrote down, is this true of, your, of my ministry? You know what happened when I went back and read that verse again? I realized... I have fault with my ministry in the area of kindness. And that is discrediting the validity of my message. There were old videos had put up on YouTube. Too hard. Was it truth? Sure. But there were some hard statements. Too dogmatic. Too rash. Not enough clarification. And I remember staring at this text in my conscience and thinking, Lord, is that You? And then it's like, well, obviously it's not the devil. The devil's not trying to make me holy. It's God. He's convicting me. There's not kindness. There's fault with the ministry of I'll be honest. What am I going to do about it? I'm being discredited. Well, no one's going to notice, right? No, people will. 
There's been emails, people saying, I think that video is a little too hard. What am I going to do about it? Well, boy, the video has 250,000 views. Thousands of people watch it all the time. I should leave it up. At least it's doing some good. No, it's discrediting my ministry. Fault. And it's discrediting the ministry. God gave me the grace to take it down. To delete it. Why? The love of Christ controls me. And that will lead you to take the things that discredit you even if you can't commend yourself in kindness, but in harshness you discredit your ministry. It will lead you to deal with it. Because by not dealing with it, you're leaving obstacles all around you. And as you're trying to give them the Gospel, they're tripping there. Well, that man gave me a message, but he was so hard. I mean, how can it be validated? And yes, they'll say, is God a God of love? And yes, people will wrongly accuse you. But don't be so quick to say it's their fault. Be quick to look at yourself and say, search me, O God, and try me. If there be any way grievous in me, Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. Paul went on and he said, what next? Kindness and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians, our Gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you. Can I say that about my ministry? Being an ambassador and a minister of God to reconcile people through Christ to God. Can I say that the power of the Holy Spirit is in that? This will help think about it. Is my ministry marked by the power of cleverness? By the power of emotion? Or is it marked by the power of the Holy Spirit? Is my ministry marked by personality? Or by the power of the Holy Spirit? Paul said when the Word came, it was in power of the Holy Spirit. It's in the power of God. Ask yourself that. I hate to keep using my own examples, but it helps paint the picture. There were other videos that had been put on I'll Be Honest. And I read this text, and I was convicted a couple years ago. And you know what it was? There were videos that weren't emphas- were, were not in the power of the Spirit, but there was too much emotionalism in it. Too much cleverness. Too much loud music in some of them. And I had emails coming in. 20, 30 emails in about five years. And I thought, is anyone right? And even if I have liberty to do what I did, is it causing a mark of stumbling? And you know, I started to listen to this one that I'd edited of Paul Washer, and I realized, wow, that music is way too loud. I can't even hear what he's saying, barely. It's a distraction. It's not balanced. But man, that video has 300,000 views. Leave it up, right? Absolutely not. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault can be found with our ministry. Is there fault with my ministry? Before anyone, before every way possible. So he goes on. And, you know, I should clarify, I'm not putting a to-do list. I'm not putting my own convictions. There's still videos on, I'll be honest, that have music. I don't think it's wrong. In 1 Kings, they came down the mountain, music was being played, and the power of the Spirit fell on them, and they started prophesying. I think there's a place for it. But I was convicted the way I had used it was not balanced, and it was wrong. And God worked that in me. And I'm I'm not trying to subtly convict anyone here. In any way. But God worked on me through 30 people emailing me, through people trying to say, I think this is I think this is manipulation. I think you're putting emotionalism. Are they true? Are they slandering me? What's valid? Took years of wrestling through to get some clarity on it. What does he come in next? By truthful speech. Truthful speech. I mean, that's another real quick way to discredit your ministry. Lying exaggerations 
You talk about a big way to discredit your ministry? Just go start exaggerating about what's really happening. Just go blow it up a little bigger with the subtle motive of I care how we appear before men. You start doing that, you're going to get discredited. As soon as people find out, that's not even true what he's saying. Paul, he sought to have truthful speech. Even in that example in Acts, he wasn't true in his speech. He cleared his conscience. Paul is being true right here. He says later, I'm opening my heart wide to you. Is your heart wide open? Not just am I saying true things, but am I sincere? Or am I superficial? Do people look at me and think I'm not real? And that was one thing that hit me about this church when I first came here years ago. I realized people are real. This isn't superficial. It's real. It's genuine. That's huge. That's something we can commend. People, wow, they're real. They don't have a tons of mask that they're wearing. They're not putting a show on. They're having truthful speech. You know, if you're a new convert here and in the workplace, you in any way slip and you say something profane, you're, you are discrediting your ministry. You're discrediting your testimony as a Christian. James 1.26 says, If anyone cannot bridle his tongue, his religion is worthless. It's worth nothing. There's no value to this man's religion. It doesn't matter if he's doing all of these good works. If he can't even bridle the tongue, the rudder of his ship, what direction do you think the ship is going in? It's a worthless religion. Can you commend yourself? For truthful speech. Do you speak truth? Are you honest? Are you honest? Is your heart wide open? He goes on and he says, the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, or 1 Corinthians 2, 4, Paul said, My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You think about uh, Peter, 1 Peter 4.11, let the one who serves, let the one who speaks, speaks with the strength that God supplies, so that in everything God will be glorified. Can I say that about my speech? Is my speech, is my ministry marked by the power of God? Very similar to the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that so in my ministry? You know, in that same passage, Paul, he says, we didn't come to you in cleverness of speech. You can, you can go find a lot of ministries. Their luring factor is clever speech. Not the power of God. It's how clever they say it. And they're commending themselves to the lost world in how they can say things. And Paul saying, no, I commend myself by the power of God. Not how well I thought I could say it in a clever way. So, lastly, this third area. Various circumstances under which he maintained his ministry without fault. Just refresher, we started in verse 4. We looked at the trials. He maintained his ministry without fault. He maintained his integrity in those trials. Then we looked at the graces, the gifts, the fruits of the Spirit that he maintained his, his integrity by exerting by using. And now we're going to look at the circumstances he was put in in which he used those graces and maintained his ministry without fault. So 2 Corinthians 6, 7, by truthful speech and the power of God with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. And I, I just want to start in through honor and dishonor through slander and praise. Through honor and dishonor. Who are we honored by? Who do you ultimately want honor before? God. You know, the thing that gripped Paul was not, I'm honored before men. It was that he was honored by God. Yet in the midst of being dishonored by men, he maintained his credibility. Look, when someone slanders you, when they dishonor you, when they insult you, 
how you respond will either give credibility or discredit your ministry. Will either lay an obstacle to find fault with your ministry or will lay a path of blamelessness for your ministry. Of bringing souls to Christ. The most important ministry anyone in the world can be given. And we've been given it. We've been entrusted with the Gospel. The good news of how a sinner can be saved from hell. Saved from his sins. Paul said, we have become and are still like the scum of the world. The refuse of all things. Paul is not talking about honor here before men. He's talking about I'm honored before God. I'm dishonored before men. I'm the scum of the world before men. He goes on and he says, slander and praise. Slander and praise. Why would I commend myself to you that I've been slandered? Why? Because woe to you when all speak well of you, for so was it true of the false prophets. I think that's one reason behind Paul, his commendation. I've been slandered. Yet remember, in the midst of slandering, he responded correctly. We commend ourselves to you in that we get praised. Well, Look, if, if the Christian, the true Christian, never gets praised and all anyone says is negative things about them, then there's a warning. You know, if all anyone, do you have anything you can praise about David Butterball, about me, about anyone in here? If you can't think of one thing that's praiseworthy, then there's a problem. That doesn't mean we praise them to put them up in a proud, lofty place that they're going to fall and crash from one day. Not at all. So Paul, in the circumstances of being praised and slandered, he commended his ministry. He didn't discredit his ministry. He didn't retaliate. He, didn't, he sought to not put a fault. We go on. We are treated as impostors and yet are true. You know, I, I just think of the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone was in, is treated as an impostor, it was Christ. Some said He's a good man. Others said, no, on the contrary, he leads the multitudes astray. Treated as imposters. Christ was treated as an imposter. People said he was of the devil. Paul was treated as an imposter. We're treated as imposters. And yet we're true. Yet we are true. We really do have the truth. Paul's commending that. He goes on, as unknown and yet well known. Unknown. We're not famous in the world. Yet well, yet well known. Who are we well known by? By God. Again, that's got to be your motive. You want to be well known by God. If your motive is to please man, Paul said, if I'm now seeking to please man, I'm not a slave of Christ. I'm not a servant of the Lord. I'm my own selfish servant. For the man who's self-seeking, Paul said, there'll be nothing but wrath and fury. We're seeking to please our Master. He's our one Master we have. As unknown and yet well known. Isn't the temptation to want to be well known before men? If that's your motive, it's not a love for Christ that compels your ministry, you're going to get discredited. It's going to lead to it. Pride, it leads to destruction, the Proverbs say. He goes on as dying and behold we live is punished and yet, and yet not killed. Is sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. Sorrowful. Think of Romans 9. He had unceasing sorrow and anguish for his kinsmen in the flesh that they would be saved. And yet at the same time, Paul says to rejoice in all circumstances. I commend myself to you. I have sorrow and a true burden for souls. I have sorrow like the man of sorrows, Jesus Christ, who I imitate. And yet at the same time, I've got joy. I'm not in some dead religion where I'm just depressed and I look sad all the time and there's no rejoicing and leaping for joy. Uh, Yet I feel sorrow for problems in the church. I'm not that fake person, Paul's saying, who where there's problems in the church and he's just whoopity doo da day, everything's fine. No, he's fasting, he's praying, he's seeking God. You think about Christ, like David mentioned, Christ prayed all night before he made a decision. Paul says, I commend myself through sleepless nights.
I don't have time to finish going through all of those. And I didn't have thoughts on all of them that I felt I could bring. I, just, I want to conclude. We are ministers of the Gospel. You've been entrusted with the most... I mean, it's not just you don't want to have doctrinal air in your message. We rejoice in that for the most part, from our present understanding, in the essential issues of the Gospel. We believe we've got, we've got the truth. We've got confidence there. We're not shaky. I hope we understand the Gospel. No. We know it. We know what it is. But you don't just want to think, well, that's great. No, you want to look at your own life as an ambassador of Jesus Christ and you want to ask yourself, am I putting fault anywhere in my life before anyone that is discrediting my message of the Gospel? Even you think about that thing of being too harsh. There have been times where people would look in the past on me, and I may have the right Gospel, but I'm so harsh. The other person has this false Gospel, but they have some apparent love there, so the person listens to the more loving person and not to me. And you, think, you say, well, but yeah, but you know, they wanted the false Gospel. No, look, there are real genuine times when people will discredit you because you're harsh, because you're mean. It doesn't matter how true your message is. And yes, do people run the other direction so often? Sure, but we're looking at ourselves. We're not looking at them. We're examining our own hearts, our own ministries. Paul calls us to imitate Him. He said in 2 Timothy, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Can you say that? I endure everything everything. I endure instantly saying, Lord, take, I, I'm not using that right. I'm not using that right. Lord, this conviction, I, I, I'm going to be so careful, so careful to not try to be someone else's conscience. Lord, I want to be in the middle ground. I don't want to put a fault in either of those things. And obviously, I don't want to put a fault with sin. Is there any impurity in my life? Is there any area where there's not truthful speech in my life? Is there any area where there's not kindness in my life? Is there an area where there's not patience in my life? If there is, it's not just, well, I have my own personal sin I need to deal with. Your personal sin can discredit your ministry. That's what Paul's saying. You need to realize that. They can look at you and say, what kind of messenger are you? Yeah, you may have the Gospel right. But look at that. Look what you're doing. Are, we, are you seeking in every way to everyone to put no obstacle so no fault may be found with your ministry of reconciling souls to God? You know, you think about us as a church. And we're all being sanctified. We all haven't arrived and we never will arrive. We know that's true. But at the same time, may we never know like I had my conscience pricking when I read 2 Corinthians 6.3 years ago, and I knew I had fault with my ministry. May that never be you or I, and we just brush it aside. And you know, the glorious saying is, the Spirit of God will work. The Lord is so kind to pursue us, to go after us, to make sure we clear our consciences, to make sure we don't have a fault. His name's at stake. And he says in the New Covenant, I'm going to cause you to walk and obey My statutes. I'm going to will and work in you to do for My good pleasure. So as a church, we need this attitude. If every one of us had this attitude, what a beautiful thing it will be. And maybe we all do to some measure. I believe we all do. As Christians, none of us want to sin. But we need to realize more how we can put obstacles and we need to flee from it then I just again ask you the question, if there are obstacles that you're putting out, are you removing the stumbling blocks? Are you removing them? I mean, a stumbling block, it doesn't move itself. 
You're responsible. I'm responsible to be proactive to go after those things. Well, that's all I have. Read verse 3 again. In light of today being the day of salvation, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. Brethren, it is something. We're in the day of salvation. We've got the full canon of Scripture. We've got the message. What a privilege. And we want the message to be backed up with a credible ambassador. If an ambassador from America goes to another country and he's found lying, he just lost credibility. If he's found not having truthful speech, he's lost credibility. If he's found not having purity, he's lost credibility. May that not be us. May we commend ourselves in every way. Let's pray. Lord, we just... Lord, verses like this, it just makes us entrust ourselves to You all the more. Why? We need You. Lord, we need You. How on earth can we be like Paul and imitate him? How on earth can we seek to please everyone in everything we do? What a standard. What a thing. How on earth can we do it? Lord, we can do it by the power of You. We can do it by Your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I just pray You'd help us. Lord, help us as a church. Help us as individuals to put no obstacles in anyone's way. That our church, that our own ministry as an individual will not be discredited in any way. Will not find fault in any way. And Lord, give us the amazing humility. Give us uh, the grace that when these things happen in our own lives, Lord, that we would deal with them and not put them off. So Lord, we, we just ask You to help us as we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, and lay aside every sin and weight that cleans so easily. Lord, give us grace. Bless, Lord, bless the meal time. Bless the fellowship time. Lord, I even think of how many sins in my own life have come to the surface, even in the middle of fellowship and with other saints. Lord, You've used them to be iron, to just, to just go right on top of me and to, and, to, and to take a dull area of me and sharpen it up. So Lord, thank You. Thank You, Lord, for giving us this body of like-minded believers. And Lord, we want to be more like-minded like Christ. Give us grace. In Jesus' name, amen.